Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. Today we're going to be talking about pronouns and how these little words do a lot of work. But first, let's talk about where our logo comes from. So when we were coming up with the idea that maybe we want to start a podcast and we started talking about logos because that's the first thing, obviously, we realized that Superlinguo, Lauren's blog, uses a yellow green background and my blog, All Things Linguistic, uses teal background, kind of a bluish green. So we figured that a true green, a vivid green, was the logical way of splitting the difference between that. We're both big green fans. And uh, we also have IPA symbols in both of our logos. Superlinguo has a schwa, and uh, All Things Linguistic has three. And I can't even remember. How bad is that? There's a theta. I know that. It's Alpha Theta Lambda. It's an acronym. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but they're also symbols that are used in linguistics. So kind of nerdy linguistic symbol logos uh, meant that we, we were going to continue that theme with this one as well. Uh, and so we ended up going with the one that we have, which is a triple purpose logo. If you haven't seen it, it's presumably in the icon of whatever program you're using to listen to this podcast. We decided the symbol that is there looks like the International Phonetic Alphabet symbol for the glottal stop, which is the sound in uh-oh, this kind of stop of air in the back of your throat. But we got it by cutting off the dot at the bottom of a question mark, because that gave us more font options. <laughs> Unfortunately, disappointingly few stylish fonts have full IPA range for the International Phonetic Alphabet. We were very disappointed that this was actually one of the reasons why we picked the glottal stop, because that way we could just chop off some question marks and we'd have a lot more stuff to choose from. And then we kind of liked that the end result of the one that we chose looks a little bit like a little ear. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks a little bit like an ear, it looks a little bit like a question mark itself because we are curious about things and it is also uh, an IPA symbol. Because we are <laughs> quite enthusiastic about things. We are very enthusiastic, yay! Uh, and the name, I guess, probably should be pretty obvious. Uh, I'm still disappointed. That's a little bit of a Okay. Today we are going to talk about pronouns, which some of you might kind of have a kind of trauma of, it sounds like a dirty word from grammar classes uh, in high school, or some of you may be going into sweats from recollections of learning second languages. But we think pronouns are pretty rad, and so today we're going to be talking about those. Yeah, pronouns are fun. So pronouns, if you forget what they are, are these little words that stand in place of a noun. So you have things like I, me, you, your, our, we, she, he, it, they, all of the little pronouns that do stuff like that. Instead of just continually repeating the noun, you can use a pronoun instead. So hypothetically, they're a way of making language more efficient because you don't have to just keep saying the noun over and over again. We've all had this conversation with people who just keep repeating your name and you're like, no, it's just to stop. It's the creepy like AI robots in sci-fi will always continue to refer to you. Oh yeah. By your full name and it's really creepy. What are you doing, Hal? Hal, don't do that. Always includes that full noun reference and it's super creepy in extended conversation. Yeah, you know, if you want to try this at home, uh, creep out your friends by saying their names all the time uh, in every sentence and they'll probably get annoyed at you. The thing that makes pronouns so interesting in conversation is um, to use the fancy linguist term, they're dialectic. To use the actual, what does that mean term? They they point at some. I always think of it as like a pointing thing. So it means that they don't always point at exactly the same thing all the time. Where they point depends on the context in which they're employed. It sounds painfully obvious until you're trying to pull it apart in a language you don't speak that well. But when I say I, I for me means Lauren, and you in this context means you, Gretchen. Yes, uh, it also means you, the listener, you, plural. But when I say I, I means me, Gretchen, and not you, Lauren, because you're a different person. And the thing is, you can see little kids get this wrong. Like, they'll refer to themselves as you, because that's what everyone else calls them. And they have to figure out, no, mommy is you, and daddy is you, and the dog is you, but I am I. 
when I use when it. When I use it. And uh, little kids will get this wrong initially, often, when they're, when they're learning a language. And so it's not completely obvious to people, but it's a very important insight when it comes to pronouns. And that's why robots in AI, in sci-fi, sound really creepy. But it is something that's quite hard to keep track of, these references and who is being referred to by which pronoun in conversation. Yeah, and different languages kind of carve up the pronoun space differently. You know, I think a lot of languages make this distinction between the person who's doing the talking. So this is the I or we. I'm either talking on behalf of myself or on behalf of a group. And the person who's being talked to, which is the you, you singular, you plural. English used to have thou and thee to be a singular second person pronoun. And, you know, now we have innovative forms like you all and you guys and y'all and a whole bunch of other. Use. Use is the Australian one. Ah, good. So uh, we have all of these different ways of carving up the, the pronoun space. And then in the third person pronouns, we have a whole bunch of different ways. And even within the first and second person, so the first being me and second being you, even within those, there are lots of different ways to carve up the space. And, and lots of different languages do different things that are really neat. One thing I like about Yolmo, which is a Tibetan language that I work with, is that they have inclusive and exclusive versions of us. And the inclusion and exclusion is referring to the person that you're speaking to. So you can use one form and it means we, including you who I'm talking to right now, are all going to go to the cinema. And then there's a we are all going to the cinema, but we're not including you who I'm talking to right now in, the, in that group of we. Which I think is a socially very handy thing to have. Yeah, I mean, it's the difference between we're going to the movies, are you ready yet? And we're going to the movies, see you later. Yeah, as someone who is like incredibly incapable of reading social interactions very well, I think this kind of thing in English would be so handy to know if you're included in the trip to drinks after work or if you're included in the meeting or something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really useful distinction, this inclusive and exclusive we, and English doesn't have it. That's, that's one of the things I wish English had. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun one. And English is kind of gradually working on trying to figure out a pull you form. We've got a bunch of them. different dialects, but not a standard one for writing. And that's a massive lack because you want to be able to distinguish between, you know, are you coming and are all of you coming? Because again, you know, who's invited? Yeah. Oh, and then another distinction that gets made with second person pronouns is you can make a lot of politeness distinctions in second person. So you can say, you know, you informal, you formal. So I speak French and uh, French makes distinction between tu and vous where uh, where two is informal and also singular, and vu can be either singular or plural, but when it's singular, it's formal. I find actually the weird thing about this is I get annoyed because I don't have an equivalent of you all. Like, I don't have a way of being unambiguously plural. Because sometimes, you know, if I go to a store and I want to say, do you guys have any bananas or something? And I don't want to imply... As opposed to you specific cashier, do you have any bananas with you right now? Yeah, I, I don't want to put them on the spot. Like, it's not your fault if you're out of bananas. Like, that's the store manager's fault or something. Like, yeah. so it's weird to me that I don't have an unambiguously plural pronoun. But I do instead have to navigate this politeness distinction where, you know, if you, uh, particularly when you're dealing with kind of like strength that you meet in public, and so you don't have any frame of reference to know anything about them already, do you use the the two or yeah. the vu and you know kind of depends on their age and whether it seems like you're your peers or they're like an older person and you want to respect them or something like that as an english native speaker so growing up with a language that doesn't have any kind of politeness distinction like that and growing up in australia which is kind of stereotypically famous for its lack of any kind of formal register even though that's not entirely true. But this distinction in formality really made me, and you hear this a lot from English speakers when they learn languages with these pronoun difference distinctions, it really stresses them out as to which one is appropriate. And I started learning Nepali, which has not only two, it has three different politeness distinctions. So it has like the formal polite pronoun, and then it has the like one that you can use with people who you're close to. And then it has one that is for like, it's for children and dogs. And so my Nepali teacher just didn't even teach me that one. She's like, as a foreigner, there is no social situation in which that one is going to be appropriately useful for you. And so trying to navigate when which one is appropriate it, it can be, it can feel a bit stressful. Yeah, I, I mean, I get it because so I learned 
France French, but now I live in Quebec. But in France French, they use vous a lot more than in Quebec French. So in Quebec French, to a stranger in right. public, you're a lot more likely to say tu, whereas in France French, you're more likely to say vous. Hmm. So I know I'm too formal for some people. And like, they'll vous me back, yeah. but like, they don't really think they should be needing to. <laughs> Right, yeah, and because there's a thing that, like, maybe being polite is just, like, the best default thing to do. But then in some social situations it actually pushes people away and makes it... Yeah, and being polite can kind of create this social distance. Yeah. You know, there are some languages where using words like please and thank you or, like, you know, polite forms to ask someone to pass you the beans or whatever is actually ruder if you say it to a family member because you shouldn't have to be polite to a family member. Yeah. And that's a sign of social distance between you. So, yeah, politeness pronouns are a very complicated thing and they're complicated for native speakers so there's a article in the latest edition of language which is a scholarly journal and it looks at pronouns in spanish so spanish has a very similar distinction to that in french where it has a formal and informal register and so this work was done by chase wesley raymond who's at the university of colorado and this was a, a massive corpus study so there are over a thousand speakers in the corpus and hundreds of hours of recorded conversations between different people in different contexts and this study demonstrated you know people who speak these languages probably have these feelings anyway but the study demonstrated that when people use polite or the formal or informal pronouns these aren't fixed there's no like clear rule that you can put in a textbook to learn it's that these things are negotiated and they can change and people can shift to being informal to throw someone off or they can become more formal because they're in the workspace whereas they might be less formal if they're hanging out with this person in some other context so even for native speakers there's not always a kind of fixed rule oh this person is my superior so I will always use the polite form or something like that. Yeah I think that was one of the things that surprised me is I found that sometimes I would use the pronouns inconsistently and I thought that I was doing something wrong as a non-native speaker of French that I was using vous and tu with the same person sometimes and yet it turns out that that's a thing a lot of people do and to try to negotiate that. I thought you know because the textbook gives you like okay we have to have this dialogue where we officially say shall we now to each other and that's not a dialogue i've actually had very often yeah people often figure it out but yeah it's a it's an important question let's move on to third person pronouns okay because there's also a lot of interesting stuff that goes on with them yeah um and one thing that happens with third person pronouns is what i have called in a blog post the gay fan fiction problem that very serious linguistic problem. It's a very serious <laughs> linguistic problem that happens when you have a narrative with multiple people using the same pronoun and you have to figure out how, you know, he touched his hand, who's touching whose hand or other parts of the body. Yeah, especially when this has been going on for multiple paragraphs. Yeah, for pages and pages and pages. And so you don't want to necessarily keep repeating their names. You often get people using epithets, you know, like the taller one or the shorter one. But then it's not always clear, you know, which character is actually taller, which character is shorter. You have to then go remember who's taller, who's younger, or who, which one is blonde or something like that if you want to use descriptions of them. So to try to figure out how do we track multiple people when we're telling a story with people and we want to have the efficiency gain of using pronouns, but... Everyone's a he or everyone's a she. Yeah, so one of the things people ask about pronouns sometimes is why do we have gender in pronouns? And one of the reasons is that it's a rough and ready way of kind of trying to divide the population into two equal groups. And it's not perfect, but it's better than some of our other options, like dividing people into groups of, you know, tall and short people or young and old people or something like that. Like it's, it kind of works in a lot of situations that statistically some people in a group will be male and some people in a group will be female. So, you know, it's not the straight fan fiction problem because those ones you do have pronouns to help hard. If there are only two people in an interaction. Well, so there's two problems, right? There's the gay fan fiction problem, and then there's the orgy fan fiction <laughs> problem. Or sorry, the poly fan fiction problem. And those are two separate problems. Yeah, but when they collide, it's very complicated. When they collide, it's even worse, yeah. The, the, the gay poly fan fiction problem. Not all languages have this problem. Yeah. For their gay fan fiction. I don't know if all languages write gay fan fiction, but they presumably all tell stories where multiple people are involved. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren, you have an interesting example of this not happening? So one example is where you have two different, maybe he or she or they, um, but you have two different versions of they. One 
that you use for one referent and one you use for a referent that has already been discussed. And the fancy word for this is logophoric pronouns. But essentially what logophoric pronouns can do is solve the... When you say something like that, he said that he is going to cook a barbecue for us on the weekend. So in isolation or in a, an ongoing context, if you're talking about Bob and Dave, and you could say Bob said that Dave's going to cook a barbecue on the weekend, or Bob said that Bob himself will cook a barbecue on the weekend. But if you're just using pronouns, he said that he's going to cook a barbecue on the weekend. You don't actually know if he is the person that will do the cooking or if he's assigning someone else that promise. And so logophoric pronouns are like he, the person who is that he will cook a barbecue, or he said that some other him will cook the barbecue. Yes, yeah, so you have different pronouns for referring back to the person who was already speaking versus referring to a different person from the one who was speaking. Yeah, and so I think it would solve the he put his hands on his hips problem, where it would become clearer if someone's putting his hands on his own hips or on some other dude's hips. So I, I don't know if that solves that problem. It solves the like he said that he loved him problem. Oh yeah. But I don't know, well, I guess in that case, or, you know, he said that he wanted to come over or something. I don't actually speak a language with logophores, so I don't know if you can do it with, he put his hands on his hips. No, to be honest, I don't know these languages well enough yeah. to okay. make that promise, to be honest. What I was going to say is that one thing that I know does solve this problem, which is not logophores, is a different phenomenon, which is known as obviation. And that's a phenomenon where your pronouns, instead of having gender, they track mm -hmm. how important someone is to the discourse. So basically you have the more important or the more central person get one pronoun and the less important or less central or less focal person or persons get a different pronoun. Oh, I could see that being handy. Yeah, and so sometimes it's called third person and fourth person in the sense that, you know, if you have a have a scenario with multiple people in it, the third person is obviously more important or more central somehow than the fourth person. And this is, of course, a storytelling device. So, you know, you can decide as the storyteller who is more important to your story. There's no gender involved, so either it's third person put third person's hands on fourth person's hips or third person put third person's hands on third person's hips. So you can track who's who along that situation. And that allows you to very easily keep track of two different persons. And the way you kind of introduce them is when you first say their names or you first say, you know, the noun or something that's associated with them that the pronouns are going to have to refer to is you put a little marker on the names, like a suffix that indicates that this one is going to be your third person one or this one is going to be your fourth person one. And then afterwards you can just refer back to them with that. Nice. So it's very interesting from a storytelling perspective because then you can retell the story the same way if you just swap which one is obviative, which one is fourth person, yeah. then the story gets a completely different focus. This is kind of interesting. Huh. Yeah. Cool. So, obviation does a great job of solving the gay fanfiction problem. It doesn't do a whole lot to solve the poly fanfiction problem, because generally you have a third person and a fourth person, and so if you end up with four or five people in a scenario, that's not... Just not enough pronouns to go around. Yeah, some uh, languages have a more obscure pronoun known as the further obviative, which is like mm. a person. So you can have like three people of various levels of importance in a scenario, but I haven't seen it used a whole lot because I guess okay. I guess making this distinction two ways is enough for a lot of languages. And of course there are a set of languages where none of this is a problem at all, and they are sign languages that use spatial locations for pronominal reference. So in sign languages, generally what what happens is to make the equivalent of a pronoun in a language like English, they'll sign someone's name or a reference to someone or their actions in a particular space and then that space will be used to call back to that person throughout the interaction. Or the person can move around in the kind of signing space, but they're always able to be spatially referred to. So signing space could be like top left or towards the right of the person who's signing or something like that. Yeah. I mean, when you speak English and you gesture across a narrative, you're possibly doing this without really thinking about it anyway. So you may be referring to, who were my barbecuers again? Bob and Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bob and Dave might get referred to one, you know, Bob's on the left, Dave's on the right, and I kind of keep referring to them and gesturing throughout the interaction. But in sign languages like Auslan, which is the one I kind of know this type of example from best, Bob will get put in a particular space and he'll be signed there and then he'll kind of keep being called back to from there. So if the barbecue is to the left of us and Bob's by the barbecue, then we set up the barbecue on the left, we set up Bob near the barbecue, and then we have Dave over by the house on the right or yeah. something like that. And so if Bob says something, I'll 
sign what Bob said in the left hand space. Or kind of turn your body towards that space as if yeah. you're speaking from Bob's perspective. Yeah. Um, I don't know much ASL, but I've seen people talk about this in ASL as well. It's a very elegant solution. It's beautiful. And the nice thing about it is you're not limited to just having people on the left or people on the right, because you could have someone that's kind of like top left, or bottom left, top right, bottom right. Yeah, I don't know what the maximal number of... I guess it's however many people can kind of keep track of in the narrative. I feel like I've heard someone say seven, but that might be false. A good storyteller, surely. Yeah, if you're like a really good storyteller, you can keep track, kind of fan them out around your face. Yeah. But definitely you can do more than two, which is fantastic. And it doesn't matter anything about their gender because you can just set them up wherever they want. Gender doesn't matter, number doesn't matter, all of those kind of things. So sign languages have solved the gay fanfiction orgy problem. All other languages will have to figure out how to do that. Playing catch up, really. Yeah, you know, or just learn a sign language so that you can write better fanfiction. Yeah. That's, that's a good reason. The obvious solution. <laughs> the clear and obvious solution. <laughs> Solution. So we, we talked about language typology systems, but another thing that comes up in English and other languages is the idea of a gender neutral pronoun, especially in the third person. Yeah, we are technically unable to do this podcast on pronouns without mentioning English singular they. It would be a crime. Because it's the one that keeps making the headlines. It's been very popular. It was word of the year for the American Dialect Society last year in 2015. Yes, it was. I was there at that vote. Uh, and we were pretty excited about it. Did, did you vote for Singular Thing? Yes, of course I did. I actually wrote a whole article nominating it for Word of the Year. So what even is Singular They? So Singular They is the use of they, which is traditionally thought of as, and I'm going to put a large asterisk beside this because I'm going to get back to that, <laughs> as a plural third person pronoun, as a singular pronoun. And it is not a new thing in English. And this is why I want to put that asterisk back traditionally. Because using they in a singular form is actually very, very old. So this is examples like if you say someone left their umbrella and you don't know whose umbrella it is, but generally people don't share in joint ownership of umbrellas, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this day and age of affordable umbrellas. And when you say, like, it's not recent, it's like, you know, Jane Austen used singular they in this context. Shakespeare used singular they in this context. Chaucer used singular they. It goes all the way back to Old English. In fact, singular they is only about 100 years younger than singular you. Right. So if you remember when we started losing thou. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> back in the day. I know. Just get in your time travel box. And go back to when people started using you for singular, then jump forward about a hundred years, and you'll hear people starting to use they as singular. In fact, I don't know, maybe they were using it earlier, this is just when we have written records. Prove it to us with an example. Yeah, so um, this is going to be me badly pronouncing Middle English. Yes! Because I am not a, an English historian. So this is from Chaucer the Pardoner's Prologue, around 1395, which goes... And whoso findeth him out of switch blame, they will come up. And so this means approximately, and whoever finds him, whatever out of switch blame means, they will come up. So this whoever is a non-specific singular person, and you can tell it's singular because it's using the conjugation findeth, and then they is being used to refer back to whoso. Yeah, okay. So here's one from 1489, um, which goes, each of them should make themselves ready. So that's an example of singular themself from Caxton. He is also old. He is also very old. And here's the Shakespeare example, which goes, There's not a man I meet but doth salute me, as I were their well-acquainted friend. So that's from the Comedy of Errors in 1594. So Shakespeare said it must be legit. Shakespeare said it must be legit. Right. So this is not a new and exciting thing. Why the hell was it word of the year last year? Yeah, so why talk about it as if it's something new? Well, for one reason, it's a word of the year doesn't have to be brand new. It's generally newly prominent. So people are talking about it more. And when you looked at what types of words people were talking about, singular they showed up in there. I did a Google Ngram search that showed that people were searching for it more. It seemed to be there was a, a meeting of the American Copy Editor Society, which Ben Zimmer was at and reported on people talking about Singular They a lot there. And then a lot of people read Ben Zimmer's article about the copy editor's meeting and thought, oh, well, that's interesting. So there was a lot of talking about Singular They. Right. And what a lot of people were talking about with Singular They was not just this non-specific usage, this stuff like, you know, each of them should make themselves ready or, you know, and whoever finds him, they should come. It's this specific usage for a particular person, which is also not completely new, but not as old as Shakespeare. 
Right. So older examples, it's talking about they as in like it could be anyone. Whereas now it's about a specific person in the way that you is about a specific person or he or she. Yes, it's about a specific person. So in the way that I prefer, people refer to me as uh, with the pronouns she and her when they're talking about me in the second person. Some people say, could you please refer to me using the pronouns they and them when you're talking about me in the third person? And that's something that's a newer phenomenon. Yeah. So referring to someone as they, as a specific person. So if you say something like, Alex looked at themselves in the mirror. Yeah. And so you have singular they there. Yeah. Because the thing is, for the non-specific kind of singular they, you can often kind of find a way to write around it if you're not a fan. You can recast the sentence in the plural, or you can, you know, use a passive, or you can kind of do various things to try to get rid of that they if you're really determined that it can only be singular. Yeah. For an individual person who says, you know, please refer to me as they, the way to get around that is our, you know, kind of our gay fan fiction problem where you have to refer to them by their name every single time. And that's just creepy. It's just creepy. It gets really weird sounding really quickly. Yeah, I mean, unless that's a person's preference, and then as well as you can deal with the cognitive load of that, fair enough. Yeah, it, it's definitely a lot more difficult if you don't have any pronouns at all to refer to someone. Yeah. So singular they as an individual pronoun for a specific person is a phenomenon that people have been advocating for a lot more recently, um, and it's gotten a lot more visibility. And then that becomes kind of, well, if you're going to accept singular they to refer to a specific person, why not let the non-specific use in by the back door while we're at it? Yeah, it's a much easier way to just, you're just kind of creating a, just pushing a little in the paradigm and creating a little space that people are increasingly finding is necessary. And it may feel a bit weird now, and I know some people really struggle to find it grammatically acceptable, but I think over time it will normalise. And a good example of the likelihood of that is from Sweden. So Sweden has a she and he equivalent, it's hon and han. I am definitely not saying those right, sorry Swedish people. But now Swedish speakers have officially have the option of using a gender neutral form hen. So officially as in like it's now in all government documents and uh, legal, anything where it doesn't need to refer to someone specifically as male or female, the form hen uh, can now be used. Yeah, and we know that, you know, even if the current generation of speakers have a bit of difficulty with it, if you expose kids to something, it's something they can learn. In particular, you know, gender neutral pronouns are a thing that many languages have, and so there's no reason why kids can't learn that in English as well, even if it's a bit harder for an adult. Adults can learn whole new languages. It takes some effort, but you, you can learn a new language. Like, learning some new pronouns for a given language, yeah, it takes some effort, but it's not impossible. No, my feeling is if someone wants to be called by whatever pronouns they want to, they've generally gone through a lot more massive process in their life to come to that decision and feel comfortable with sharing it with people than I have to go through to change a very tiny part of my linguistic behaviour. Yeah, I feel like it hurts the other person more for me not to use their correct pronouns than it does for me to figure out how to use those myself. Yeah. Yeah, so singular they is one of the most visible of these gender-neutral third-person pronouns for English because it has this non-specific use that's been going on for a long time. But there is also a whole set of other non-specific third-person pronouns that are used in English. So people have come up with other suggestions to kind of fill the paradigm but not mean that we have the same problem that we have with you where it can be singular or plural. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of those and they actually go back to the 1850s. Really? I didn't know they were that old. Yeah, so the earlier usage in so far as there are records of it, because I haven't been able to find ones on the, you know, non-binary activism side, but maybe they exist. But the ones that I have records of are grammarians saying, well, gosh, we can't deal with this plural pronoun being used for the singular, so let's invent one for the singular, because clearly it's necessary to have a non-gender alternative for the singular. So they're approaching it, at least the records that I'm aware of are approaching it from a grammatical perspective initially. I love that. Yeah, so the term is epicene pronoun. Mm -hmm. And it goes way back. There you go. Do you know what the original candidate suggestion was or what the suggestions were? So there's this lovely website from Dennis Barron at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And he has a chronology of early non-binary pronouns. Right. And, oh wow, sorry. The earliest example is from 1792 that he has. Right. And this is the Scottish economist and philosopher James Anderson who writes an article arguing for the usefulness of an indeterminate pronoun like the pronoun ooh, recently reported in provincial use. And then Dennis Barron goes on to say that in fact Anderson went overboard suggesting that English would benefit from 13 genders. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, including two indefinite or common gender pronouns. 
Well, he's trying to solve the poly gay fan fiction orgy scenario. Oh, yeah. Wow, this is really interesting. Um, so I'm just looking at this list. So what happens when you do research while reading it out loud, Gretchen? The internet is beautiful. So if you look at his list, he has to denote male animals alone. Right. Female animals alone. Inanimate objects alone. Animate objects which either express a general class or a whole genus or where it is not necessary to specify sex at all. <laughs> Animals known to be castrated and meant to be distinguished as such. Okay. Male and females known to be such, though not meant to be separated. This is what he calls the matrimonial gender. Uh, um, so he's not gay enough. <laughs> males only, part perfect and part castrated. Oh, perfect being not castrated. Hmm, that's mm. an interesting terminology. Females and castrata. Males, females and castrata. Males and inanimates conjoined. Females and inanimates conjoined. Males, females, and inanimates conjoined. These are not matrimonial. I am, I am uh, tired. Genders. Males. <laughs> uh, males, females, and inanimates either separated or conjoined where no distinction of gender was to be meant, was to be averted to in any way. This is precisely the power of present pronoun they. So that's finally his 13th gender pronoun. Phew, I've forgotten the first one now. <laughs> yeah, so 13 genders probably not necessary but this is yeah this proposal from 1792 and then just two years later there's another article providing a critique explanation and defense of singular they and another call for the coining of a common gender pronoun there we go oh, and then we have 1808 someone suggesting that we use it for a gender neutral pronoun i think z and z is the one i know of that had kind of the most traction yeah so the z and z is one of the best known ones and it does not show up in the early list so there's a whole bunch of early proposals for gender neutral pronouns and we'll include a link to this fantastic page about them fabulous but the best known one at the moment i think is z zer which is spelled a couple different ways there's x e x i r x i e X E R, a couple different options there. Yeah. Some oh, some people spell it with a Z as well, Z I E or Z E. But as far as I know, people generally pronounce the X one as also as the. Yeah. So English pronouns have been changing as long as there has been English, and they'll continue to change. Whether that's the inclusion of singular they or Z becoming more popular, maybe we'll finally go back to having a plural U form that everyone agrees on. Yeah, I think we're on our way to a U form, but you know, we definitely haven't gotten there. Maybe if we have singular they, then we'll end up with like they all or thall, like you all and y'all. They's. They's. Vins. Vins. They guys does not work for me. I guess you could have those guys, but then you run into a gender problem. So yeah. probably I don't support that one. But Vol, I don't know. I can get my head around that. Because then you have this nice, like, y'all Vol paradigm. Vol. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. There we go. We've solved English for you. <laughs> we've solved it. <laughs> now we just need to make everyone else do the thing, which, as we've seen, is, is always a challenge. For more Lingthusiasm and links to various things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, or other podcast places, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and other social networks. I can be found at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I can be found on Twitter as Superlinguo, and I also blog at superlinguo.com. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCullough and Lauren Gore. Music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic.